Here is Dr. Brianna Kent, and uh, she's going to talk about sleep disruption in Alzheimer's disease. And I loved seeing a video some time ago when someone was sound asleep and all that amyloid was recruited out of the brain. And uh, I hope we'll hear more about that. Thank you for that introduction. Can everybody hear me? I know it can be a bit quiet. Okay, thanks. Um, so we are gonna, I'm going to talk about sleep disruption in Alzheimer's disease. But first, let's ask, why do we sleep? And actually, this is still a bit of a mystery in the scientific community. We don't actually know why we sleep. We know it's important. We spend about a third of our lives sleeping. And when you look across all animals, even fruit flies sleep. So we know it's important. It's essential for survival because not sleeping can be fatal. We know it's incredibly important for cognition. Anybody that stayed up all night or suffered from severe jet lag knows that your attention is going to be hard to pay attention to things. Uh, your reaction time, both in athletics and also cognitively, is going to be slowed. And we know that it's important for memory consolidation. So that's taking your experiences from your daily life and turning that into a long-term memory. And actually extended uh, sleep deprivation can cause hallucinations. So we know it's important for brain functioning and overall health. If you don't sleep, your immune functioning is going to go down, you're more likely to get sick, and you're at more of a risk for heart disease, diabetes, stroke, depression, cancer, and recently we're learning neurodegenerative disease. In Alzheimer's disease, we've known for quite a while that it's associated with sleep disturbances. In some cohorts, approximately 60% of patients meet the clinical diagnostic criteria for a sleep disorder. The most common symptoms are sleep fragmentation, where the individual is waking up at night, napping, where they're sleeping during the day. And when you look at the specific stages of sleep, we see a reduction in the deep sleep, that slow wave deep sleep, and REM sleep, the rapid eye movement sleep when you have your most vivid dreams. Not only is this disruptive to the patient, but we also know that this is one of the primary uh, complaints of caregivers and often leads to individuals having to move into care homes just because it's so disruptive. So the two big research questions in this field are, is there a specific sleep biomarker for Alzheimer's disease? And also, in addition to being a symptom, does the sleep disruption contribute to the disease progression? And if so, can we improve sleep as a way to slow disease progression? Now, we saw this graph in Dr. Nygaard's uh, slides, just showing the importance of looking for early biomarkers of disease, because we know that Alzheimer's disease is developing for decades prior to the memory impairment. And so if sleep disruption is occurring early when the amyloid beta is accumulating and the tau is accumulating, can that indicate that Alzheimer's disease is developing? And is there a unique biomarker? And there is some indication that the sleep disturbances occur early in the disease. In cognitively normal, healthy, elderly adults, it's been shown in some studies that they're at a 22, those with sleep disturbances are at a 22% faster rate of cognitive decline if followed over six years. And in a large veteran studies that looked at over 150,000 veterans, they showed that those veterans that reported sleep disturbances or had been diagnosed with a sleep disorder in their medical records were at a 27% increased risk for dementia. And I stress that these studies were done in cognitively normal adults, not in individuals with dementia. So it suggests that perhaps these sleep disturbances are occurring early in the disease and increasing risk of later cognitive decline. And when looking at biomarkers, we also see this relationship. So in cognitively normal individuals that have biomarkers, indications that Alzheimer's disease is developing, there seems to be an association with sleep disturbances. So one of the most common biomarkers used is in cerebral spinal fluid, CSF. And that's the fluid that surrounds the brain and surrounds the spinal cord. And we can assess it and measure the different proteins uh, by doing a lumbar puncture. And what research has shown is that individuals in cognitively normal, healthy adults, those individuals with poor sleep quality at night and napping during the day, often have the markers of Alzheimer's disease 
in the cerebral spinal fluid. So they're, they're more at risk for these biomarkers. They're seeing this association. Now, this is not just all sleep disruption. Um, it's going to be useful if we can identify, well, what is it about sleep that can indicate uh, that Alzheimer's disease is progressing and, progressing? and we don't know that yet. And this is an image from the PET scan that Dr. Nygaard was mentioning, showing amyloid accumulating in the brain. And this is just from a study showing that those with self-reported sleep disturbances were more likely to have amyloid accumulating in the brain. So it does seem that sleep disturbances early could be an indication that Alzheimer's disease is progressing even before the memory impairment. So then the question is, is this just a symptom? Is it that Alzheimer's disease is disrupting sleep centers in the brain and that it's just a symptom. But now there's a, a growing evidence that perhaps these sleep disturbances are also contributing to the disease progression. So in mice and in humans, we see time of day differences in the amount of amyloid beta. Amyloid is produced at a higher rate and increases during the day when you're awake and decreases at night when you're asleep. And this seems to be, in both mice and in humans, a sleep-dependent effect. So if you keep someone awake, more amyloid is produced. Of course, the data from mice is a lot more exact than we're just trying to estimate in humans, but we have shown this in, in mice that measuring the amount of amyloid in the brain, preventing someone from, the mouse from sleeping, it increases the amount that's produced. And sleep deprivation for eight weeks increases the amount of amyloid beta plaques in these mouse brains. And not only do we see that maybe production is changed, Oh, no, where's my mouse? Oh, I had a video. Nope. Well, here's an image from the video, just in case it didn't work. Um, <laughs> so this is an image, and this is actually what Dr. Vitti was mentioning, about this idea that amyloid beta is cleared in the brain during sleep. And this is the same mouse. On the left side, they've been injected with um, a dye during sleep, and on the right side, they've been injected with a dye during wake. And all I want you to sh see here is how much more the red dye spreads during sleep. And the idea is that the cerebral spinal fluid is flushing out the amyloid. It's a clearance uh, that's increased during sleep. So this is just new data. We don't know. Uh, it needs to be replicated, and we need to find out these mechanisms further, but it, it offers the idea that during sleep, we could actually be clearing out more amyloid beta. So what are we doing here at UBC? Well, I'm working with Dr. Hawk and Nygaard, and we're doing a combination of preclinical research with mouse models of Alzheimer's disease that carry uh, familial dementia genes that cause, they're very rare, but they cause early onset um, dementia, and they're causative in certain, a very small subset of families. And we're also doing clinical research looking at patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease and that have been diagnosed with FTD as part of the MINT clinical trial. And this work, I just want to mention, is also expanded to collaborate uh, and look at Parkinson's disease in collaboration with Dr. Martin McEwen and Dr. Jason Valerio. So how do we study sleep? Well, the brain cells, which are the neurons, communicate using both electrical signals and chemical neurotransmitter signals. And we can, these collective signals give rise to voltage changes, which we can record by placing electrodes on the skull. And what's interesting about looking at these electrical voltage changes is that different states of alertness or wake or different stages of sleep have different signatures in these electrical patterns. So you can see on the top right there, that you can see very fast frequencies when, when someone's awake, uh, and then very slow, large oscillations when someone's in their deep sleep. So we've looked at this in four different mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, and in three of them, we have found that there's a reduction in the slow wave deep sleep. They get less of the deep, large oscillations in the deep sleep, uh, and more of these faster frequencies like they're awake, suggesting that they're getting less slow wave sleep, which has been reported in patients as well. And so we're using this data to inform what we look at in our clinical assessments, in, in our clinical trials. So to study in humans, we're doing at-home longitudinal assessments. We're using actigraphy, which is like a Fitbit watch, and a portable EEG headband where they can, we can record the brain electrical activity while someone sleeps in the home environment. 
Um, for a ticker fee, now we have a co-op student, Megan, who's helped with this, and she has a poster. So please, if you're interested in looking more about the analysis of the ticker fee, she'd be more than happy to share with you the details at her poster during the coffee session. But just briefly, we're able to look at daily activity, which is the dark blue shading, or the lines along the bottom. The shading there is where we estimate that the individual is sleeping. And we're also able to assess daily light and, and skin temperature as well. And it just lets us know how much are they napping during the day? How often are they waking up at night? How much time are they spending in bed? And it's just an assessment, even though we can't get to the, the staging. And this is just an example of a daily activity of somebody who's quite active, so, um, all day in the top, and you can see in the bottom figure that it's more grouped together, the daily activity. So for the um, EEG assessment at home, we've compared this with a clinical assessment. We have a wonderful PhD student, Jonathan, who's modeling our EEG headbands. And so <laughs> thanks, Jonathan. Uh, what I just want you to know is this is Jonathan. He was a trooper. He came into the sleep clinic and let us do a full sleep assessment. But what I want you to notice here is how many wires are on Jonathan. Um, and just imagine being in an unusual environment of a sleep clinic attached to all those wires um, and how comfortable you would be sleeping. Probably not so much, but with Jonathan, you can see that headband in your home environment, we might be able to assess sleep in a more, it's more natural, regular form uh, instead of in the sleep clinic. So that's what we're trying as part of our, our study. And from these headbands, we're able to stage sleep. We're able to assess the amount of deep sleep. So this was actually my recording for about three hours wearing the headband while I sleep. And we found that comparing it to the clinical assessments that we did in the lab, uh, it's actually pretty, we're, we're getting more and more accurate, and we're pretty accurate at identifying how much deep sleep, which seems to be the most important stage for both uh, production of amyloid and also potentially clearance. So we're pretty excited about this. So for the next steps, well, the MINT clinical trial is ongoing. We hope at the end to be able to assess whether or not the medium chain triglyceride supplement is having any beneficial effect on sleep, in addition to the other mark markers that the trial is looking at, and potentially other therapies. We might be doing a ketogenic diet clinical trial or potentially dopamine agonist with Parkinson's patients and look to see whether or not uh, sleep is having, there's any benefit on sleep. So I just want to say thank you, uh, thank you for listening, um, but also thank you to my supervisor, Dr. Hawk Nygaard, and my mentor, Howard Feldman, our collaborators and our research team. Uh, and I just want to say that Megan Chen and Jonathan Fru have posters, so if you'd like to know more about their research, please go and see them during the coffee break. Thanks. <laughs>